Well, as we mentioned earlier, today we have a birthday boy in our midst, and another birthday boy with a birthday coming up, and so we're excited about them as we already sang happy birthday to them. Now, you never guess it from looking, but I believe that one of our birthday guys is an octogenarian. Uh, an octogenarian. Everybody know what that means? An octopus? No, not, not a person with eight, eight arms and legs. An octogenarian. Someone in their 80s. Someone in their 80s. Now, you wouldn't know it from looking because this guy's got a ton of energy and he serves our church and he's a, a treasurer here at the church. He's always doing things around the church. By the way, he's not the only octogenarian. Uh, we're just thankful for him today. And uh, I won't name any names, but I wonder, Dwight, do you know whose birthday it is? Dwight. That's his birthday. All right, Dwight. We appreciate you very, very much. We give Dwight a big round of applause. Now, Dwight, did you ever play golf in your lifetime? Did you ever play golf in your lifetime? I know you did. I think Linda used to play with you until one fateful day. I won't say what happened. Ask Linda after the service why they stopped playing golf. She's got quite a story to tell you. All right. Did you hear about the octogenarian and the bicenarian? Now, I bet you don't know what a bicenarian is. A bicenarian is a 20-something, someone in their 20s. So the 80-something and the 20-something went, went on a golfing trip together. Went on a golfing trip together. An old man and a 20-year-old are paired together at a golf tournament. They're playing a long par five that dog legs around some tall trees. So if you've ever golfed, you know what that might be like. You got two strategies, right? One is to kind of multiple hits and go around the dog leg. One is to try to go right up over the trees and cut off that dog leg. So as a 20-year-old young man sets up his tee shot to hit on the fairway, the old man notes, well, 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 when I was your age, we used to hit it over the trees, not around the side <laughs> along the fairway. So the 20-year-old readjusts and tries to hit his ball over the trees, but he can't clear them and he loses his ball. He tries again and loses that one, tries again, loses that one. Now he's getting really frustrated. And the older man is sitting there smiling, he kind of shakes his head puts his hand on the young man's shoulder, and consoles the young golfer. You know what he said? Of course, I should remind you that when I was your age, the trees were only six feet tall. <laughs> All that to say, happy birthday, Dwight. And uh, I hope it's a real hole in one today for you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This morning, we're continuing and nearing the conclusion of our series, Fear Not. Fear not. You know, some have a fear of getting older. There's a name for that. I'm not sure what it is, but some of us, we don't like birthdays, and we certainly don't ever want someone to know how old we are. Others of us celebrate the years of our life and give thanks to God for his blessings throughout, but some fear growing older. Of course, we are commanded in the Bible to fear whom? God. To fear God. To fear God. And fear can prompt discretion and caution. So fear isn't always a bad thing, right? It's not always a bad thing. Sometimes fear is an appropriate response. That's so bad. But unholy, untrusting, crippling anxiety and fear uh, really have no place in the Christian life. And if they are present in our lives, we need to confess that. We need to draw close to others, Christians who can help us. And we need to come to God's word and hear what God has to say. Some Christians have defined fear with this acronym. Maybe you've seen it before, this acronym, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And if you're taking notes and you're going to participate in our small groups later, this is the first blank on the back of your bulletin. False evidence appearing real. And indeed, when we're walking by faith with our spiritual eyes wide open, when we're living in the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, there is ultimately nothing, absolutely nothing to truly fear. To truly fear. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I, the Lord, am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. 
I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, later on in your small groups, you're going to talk a little bit about fear and how sometimes fear can be healthy and a healthy response. I think we understand uh, some of what that might mean, right? If you're walking up to a cliff and it's a steep drop to a certain depth, you ought to have a little sense of caution. Mm. We might call that fear. Yeah, fear of falling would be healthy yeah. in that moment. Uh, later this afternoon, I'm going to be speaking with the BBC. Did you know that? About 2 o'clock, I have an appointment with the BBC, and, and I'll be speaking there for about a half hour or so. Uh, not the British Broadcasting Company, but the Baptist Bible Church that meets right here in our sanctuary, uh, the Filipino-American Church, about the story of the 10 lepers from Luke 17. You're probably familiar with that story. Every Thanksgiving Eve, I like to tell that story here at church as an encouragement for us to return to Jesus and say thanks for answering our prayers. But in Luke 17, think about that guy who had leprosy. It would be scary to live to live as a leper in the first century Palestine. Think about it. Having an incurable skin disease, wasting away quarantined from society, separated from your family, not able to live at home any longer. You must live out uh, with another group of, of people. The only real family bond you have is that you all have a similar illness that unites you and you're suffering, disqualified from worshiping God in the temple, simply waiting for the sickness to progress to the end. Even walking by faith, that kind of a situation would seem pretty scary. And fear would not be an inappropriate feeling to have, even if there was faith in Christ to combat. If you or a family member has a, a frightening health diagnosis, it can be frightening both to the sick patient and to his or her loved ones. And I know there's people in our church that have dealt with that even just recently. That's a scary thing, and fear is a natural response. Loss of a job, an economic downturn, even elections, even, of course, wars and rumors of wars can all be quite unsettling. And yet, as we've seen these last several weeks, time and time again in God's Word, we have that simple refrain. It's on the screen. Fear not. Say that with me. Fear not. Now, Sharon our photographer here at Montrose, she took a picture of the, of the screen, and she took it to Walgreens, I think, and made a few copies. So if any of you really want to keep, uh, hold it up, Sharon, there it is right there. If any of you really want to keep uh, this in your Bible, maybe, or on your dresser to remind you of God's commands and God's promises, uh, just talk to Sharon. I think she's going to give you one, or maybe she's charging money. I don't know. Oh, she's not charging any money. But if you want one, you got to approach her and ask her for one. There's limited quantity. Fear not. So we have fear not, Abram, in Genesis. I am your shield and your reward, your protector, your provider. Fear not, Hagar. God has seen your affliction. God has heard your cry. Fear not, Isaac, for I am with you and will bless you and will keep all my promises. Fear not, Israel. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. Today we continue our, our short series in Isaiah 40 as we consider the words of God to us in Isaiah, fear not. In Isaiah 35 verse 4, be strong and fear not, the Lord says to his people. In Isaiah 40, which is an incredible turn in the book of Isaiah, if you studied Isaiah, you know that up through chapter 39, we have a description largely of Isaiah's day and his prophecies to the people of his own day. But in Isaiah 40, suddenly the, the 8th century B.C. prophet is transported to the 6th century, almost 200 years into the future, and begins speaking a word of encouragement to the exiles of Judah living in the land of Babylon. Wouldn't it have been incredible if you were one of those people who had lost your home in Jerusalem, the Babylonians invaded, they destroyed your city, they destroyed the temple in which you worship, and then they ripped you away from your family, they deported you to Babylon to live there and to work there. Wouldn't it have been 
a comfort to pick up the prophecy of Isaiah some 150 plus years earlier with these words of comfort, comfort my people, words spoken to you in the future. Isn't that pretty incredible? Yes. In fact, I think you can relate because when we pick up God's word and we read these words of comfort, we see that not only are these words meant for the exiles living in Babylon, these words are meant for us. And so we too can have that incredible light bulb like feeling of like all the tingles going through us like, whoa, the Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah spoke these words 2,000 years. 500 years ago to me and to my situation, and God still takes these words through his Holy Spirit and makes them living and active in my life today, that's pretty incredible. That's pretty incredible. So what do we read in Isaiah? Fear not, cities of Judah, behold your God. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. Fear not, I am the one who helps you. Fear not, I have redeemed you. The phrase fear not occurs at least five other times in Isaiah, 33 times uh, total, including six occurrences in the New Testament and four from Jesus himself spoken to his church, spoken to us today. Fear not. One more time, say it with me. Fear not. So let's take a look at Isaiah 40, verses 27 through 31. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. Debbie says she agrees one of our favorite passages of Scripture. And while the words fear not do not occur in this particular segment, the comforting promise of the Lord could not be more clear. So I'm going to borrow a phrase from our British friends and say today our encouragement is to fear not, to keep calm and carry on. Keep calm and and carry on. Those words that were printed on a poster in 1939, and then they were lost in some vault, rediscovered in the year 2000, and were a great encouragement to many people, even during the pandemic. Maybe you were encouraged by those words. Keep calm and carry on. That's what Isaiah 40, 27 through 31 is saying to us in a nutshell. Even in the midst of our fears, faith in God's promises empowers us to keep calm and carry on. Carry on means to endure, to persevere, to keep going, even when we're weak, even when we feel like stopping. Sometimes maybe we need a little break. That doesn't mean we drop out of the race. We keep going. We endure. We persevere to the very end. Even in the midst of our fears, if we believe God, we take him at his word, we have the power through him and his word to keep calm and to carry on. So let's take a look at verse 27. Verse 27 says, Why do you say, O Jacob, why do you speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My rights, or that is my justice, is disregarded by my God. I wonder, have you ever asked those kinds of questions? You don't need to raise your hand. Just think for a minute. Have you ever asked those kinds of questions? Why doesn't God see what's going on in my life? Because clearly if he did something different would be happening. Why is my way, my steps, my life, well, it seems like it's hidden from God. I mean, I mean, God seems to see everybody else, but he's got no eyes on me. Why is my right disregarded? My right means my justice. Why? It seems like God doesn't care about what is just and right and fair in my life. Why? Why? Now remember, these words are written to the exiles in Babylon. Those exiles include people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, many faithful people. And as I'm thinking about the statement of God and the implications of Isaiah 47, or Isaiah 40, verse 27, I'm reminded that even the strongest of faith sometimes feel forlorn. Even the strongest of faith in Christ sometimes feel forsaken. Even though we may know the facts of God's love for us and the demonstration of it at the cross of Jesus Christ, even though we know the facts, sometimes we feel a little overlooked by God. And that's what verse 27 is describing. 
It's saying, why do you feel overlooked? Why do you feel forsaken? Why do you feel forlorn? Why do you, why do you think this way? And so I just want to encourage you, first of all, with the fact that if you ever feel this way as a Christian, you're not the only one. You might think that. Oh, everybody else has such strong faith and nothing bad ever happens to them and they always just keep walking straight forward. They're never tempted to the right, never tempted to stray off to the left. They just keep their eyes on Jesus, going straight forward. But man, here I am, you know, I'm, I'm two steps forward, three steps back sometimes. Oh, we all deal with it, okay? We all feel this way. Even those exiles in Babylon to whom Isaiah was writing these words of comfort, I think we need to remember uh, that this is a common experience that we have as humans, even saved by grace, even trusting in God's promises. No temptation, no testing has seized you except what is common to man. In other words, everybody throughout the whole world is, is going through a similar suffering. Some to greater degrees, all Christians everywhere are going through similar trials and testings. And so it's good to know that we're not in this alone. And many people can feel this way as well. Let's continue on in verse 28 then. In verse 28, we're invited to think. Remember last week how we had all those questions from God? Uh, who has measured the water? Who measured the spirit of the Lord? To whom will you liken God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Uh, again, we have questions. Verse 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? God is saying, come, let us reason together. Think with me for just a moment. All right? When feelings are getting the best of you, it's important that we go back to the facts. It's important that we remind, we remind ourselves of real reality. Some people think of reality of only that which we can experience with our senses. But we know that the sense of faith gives us a real reality, a real experience far beyond. And so as we consider this and reason with the Lord, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Our creator must always be true to his character. It's impossible for God not to be God. It's impossible for God not to be true to who he is. And this verse teaches us two things about who God is. First of all, he is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Everlasting God, no beginning, no end. He's not limited by, by time. He's not limited by space. He's the limitless God, as we talked about last week. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Won't he do it? Can't he do it? Of course he can. Of course he will. He will be true to every plan that he has made. He knows the number of our days. One of our, our brothers here at church, along with one of our sisters from church, was at a funeral recently where the pastor spoke from Psalm 139, reminded that God knit us together in our mother's womb. And he's been with us. He sees us. He knows us. He's been with us every single step of the way. And so he's the everlasting God. Won't he be with you? Won't he keep his promises to you? You bet he will. Second thing we see here, that he is limitless in power and matchless in wisdom. Matchless in wisdom. All right, limitless in power. Uh, far greater than any power that we could ever imagine is the, the power of God that is demonstrated in the incredible expanse of the universe. Remember last Sunday as we considered that there are approximately uh, 10 billion trillion stars in the universe, a number we can't even imagine. Uh, 400 billion stars in the Milky Way alone. Well, why did God create all this? Well, maybe there's more to it than, than we realize from our perspective on Earth, but could it just be that he created this incredible expanse to make it crystal clear, obvious to us, that he is limitless, that he is incredible, that he is amazing, that he's worthy of our worship, so that every mouth will be stopped and everyone will be held accountable to God and at his day of judgment, no one's going to talk back to him because everybody's going to realize that he was right. He is righteous. He's God. He's limitless. 
He's matchless in his wisdom, which means that when we have questions that we can't answer, guess who knows the answers? God does. God knows the answer. His understanding is unsearchable. There are a lot of questions I have, and I've told you this before. When you're a pastor, when you're a minister, when people know that you're a Christian, and when you're outspoken about it, but especially if you're in a ministry position, sometimes people think that you're like God's defense attorney. Or that you're kind of like the person who speaks on behalf of the president, you know, at those White House briefings defending the president's decisions and those kinds of things. And people come at you with lots of questions. And the temptation can be, I gotta always defend God. I gotta always, you know, well, God doesn't need me to defend him. God doesn't need me to come to his defense. Now, that can be important. There's an area called apologetics where we defend the faith in the Lord. But God doesn't need me to defend him. I can't answer all those questions. And when people ask me the why question, there are some things in Scripture that help us understand why certain things happen. But, but ultimately, all things happen for the glory of God, according to his goodness. We might not understand it now, but from the perspective of eternity, we'll see how it all fits together. Just like a, a famous scene from the cartoon movie about the life of Moses, I believe it was, where you see the beautiful tapestry and how wonderful the picture looks on the front. But from the back side, you see all the strings going everywhere and all the pieces of yarn and fabric. And it looks like a whole chaotic mess. Sometimes that's what we see is the chaotic mess. But God sees it from his perspective. He sees how it all comes together, how it creates something beautiful. And one day, for those of us who walk by faith in Christ, when we see him face to face, we'll know fully as we are fully known. And we'll see the beauty of that which God has created, that which God has done. And we will say, yes, God, you are wise, you are perfect, and now I see. And what a beautiful moment that's going to be when we see Christ face to face and know as we are known. Let's continue on in verse 29. God is the helper of the helpless. Oh, I love that. I love that. Now, this isn't the exact statement here in verse 29. It says he gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Have you ever felt faint before? Yes. Some of you have. Maybe you were engaging in some physical activity, or maybe you were working a long shift and you weren't able to eat or to drink properly. Maybe you were you were sick and that caused you to feel faint. Or maybe you were just sort of stressed and overworked or the pressures of life or concerns for loved ones were just weighing down on you and you were like, I'm tired. I'm tired. My heart goes out to teachers. I, uh, my mom is a teacher. My Aunt Sandy is a teacher. They're here today. Um, and Tanya is, a, my wife's a teacher. Any other teachers that are here today? All right, can we just give our teachers a round of applause? My grandma, my mom, we call Grandma Joe Church, Aunt Sandy. Uh, thankful for those who teach. I taught for one year, one class in high school, a Christian high school with really good kids. It was a large class. I enjoyed the classroom experience, but the out-of-class work and the grading that I had to do, I literally was so tired that year. I remember one time, it was like 20 degrees, I'm walking home from church late Sunday night. I was so tired, I got the, to uh, Sunnyside and Merrimack, and I literally had the thought, I think I'm just going to sit here and spend the night. I literally, like that thought people have when they're in the cold and they're going to freeze to death, where you're like, I'm just going to sit down, it'll be okay, I'll just take a little break. And all of a sudden, God was like, what are you doing? You live, like, right down the block, you know? But I was so tired. Um, and so I think about that sometimes as I give thanks for our teachers out there. But I also think about that in life. Sometimes we just feel we're faint and we're weary. Even young men uh, shall fall exhausted, we'll see in just a moment. But he gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. And so he's the helper of the helpless. Verse 39 is a humbling verse, especially uh, for us uh, who think that we're all that. Verse 30 says, even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. So youths, young men, those in the, the vigor of health, those in the greatest times of their life, so to speak, even at its best and brightest, 
Human ingenuity has clear limits. Even at its youngest and strongest, human energy eventually fades, falls, fails, and falls short. So honest to God, humility is one of the greatest and most important factors in a life characterized by flourishing faith. I'll say that again. Honest before God, humility is one of the greatest and most important factors in a life characterized by flourishing faith. Being honest about our struggles, being humble before God is so important. And that really is at the heart of understanding the gospel. You can't truly become a Christian, born again, until you have come to a point where you have been honest with the Lord and admitted that you fall short. The scripture says that God created us to know us and to love us, to have a right relationship with us, but sin separates us from God. Sin is the reason why there's pain and suffering in the world. There wasn't pain and suffering. There wasn't scary health diagnosis and death and disease and natural disasters in the world that God created, but sin brought these things on through the curse. And one day when Christ returns, the new heaven and new earth, guess what will be no more? The curse. The curse will be no more. And what a glorious day that will be. But so sin is a result of, of our choices. And so being created in God's image, yet separate from him by our sin, we feel that separation. We try to close the gap between holy God and sinful us, we maybe do good works, we maybe go to church, we maybe do religious things. We think somehow that that's going to close the gap between sinful us and holy God, but nothing can close that gap. Nothing we do can close the gap between sinful us and holy God. And so what do you suppose God did in his love? How did he demonstrate his love for us? He died, he died for us. Jesus stretched out his arms upon that cross, and he died for us. The bridge between sinful us and holy God. And so Jesus paid the price for us that we receive him. To all who received him, to all who believed in his name, transferred our trust from ourselves to Christ, humbled ourselves, honestly confessed our sins, said, I do fall short. I need you, Jesus. Come into my life and lead me. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. There's one bridge across the great divide. What is that bridge? Jesus. Jesus is that bridge. Number five, and finally, verse 31. The key to living the fear not lifestyle is to wait on the Lord. If you've got an NIV Bible, it says hope in the Lord. But wait is probably a better translation. It says they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. All right, everybody wake up. Just can you flap your arms for a second? All right, uh, no. I, wait, 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 wait. Chicken wings. I didn't say chicken wings. I didn't say they shall mount up with chicken wings. I said wings as eagles. All right. Yeah. There you go. Yes, yeah, spread them all the way up. They got that huge wingspan. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. They can stop flapping now. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wow. Waiting on the Lord is the key to living the fear not lifestyle. Waiting on him means depending on him, hoping in him, expecting his promise of strength will help us rise above the difficulties and distractions of life. I like how the Life Application Study Bible says it. Do you believe God loves you and wants the best for you? Can you relax, confident that his purposes are right? Are you convinced that he has the power to control all of life and your life as well? Though your faith may be struggling or weak, accept his provision and his care for you. Wait upon the Lord. So that's the key. Wait on the Lord. Say that with me. Wait on the Lord. And the benefits of living the fear not lifestyle... Well, this verse lays out some of the most wonderful benefits. Renewed strength, soaring, running, walking, never grown weary, never faint. Now, we might not be talking literally, at least not in this life, maybe on the new earth. Maybe, maybe we will. People say, are we going to fly in heaven? And I'm like, I don't know. That just seems a little strange. But hey, it says 
will mount up with wings as eagles. Wow. Maybe we will. But soaring, running, walking, never growing weary, never faint. Uh, of course, we'll fly in the rapture event. The scripture <laughs> describes it. That'll be pretty amazing. That'll be pretty awesome. Man, run and not be weary, walk and not be faint. This is, of course, talking about the spiritual life. It's talking about our journey with Christ. It doesn't mean that you can go out from here and run a marathon without training. All right? So don't anybody have, don't anybody do something like that and then somebody write me a letter and say, so-and-so is in the hospital now because they went out and tried to sprint home and it didn't work out too well for them. <laughs> Even the strongest people, Life Application Study Bible, I love this as a resource. If you don't have one, you can pick one up. Even the strongest people get tired at times, but God's power and strength never diminish. He is never too tired or too busy to help and listen. His strength is our source of strength. When you feel all life crushing you and cannot go another step, remember that you can call upon God to renew your strength. Amen. Don't just sit down on the sidewalk. Mm. Let God know how you're feeling. He'll renew your strength. He'll help you get back home. Now, I know today we've got a, a couple octogenarians in our midst, but I don't think anybody was around in 1939 when, when this came out. Not any that are here, of course. Yeah, keep calm and carry on. Say it with me. Keep, keep calm, calm and carry on. on. In 1939, when reports were all over London and Great Britain about the, the, the missiles that were going to come whirring and whizzing towards the city and bombs that could be dropping and people were really scared, uh, the Ministry of Information printed up all kinds of posters like this one. Uh, but ultimately, I think they were concerned people would be too alarmed if they saw this stuff everywhere. So they kept these things like in a vault. And it wasn't until around the year 2000 that they were discovered. But since then, it's become a really encouraging phrase for a lot of people. And you've probably seen lots of different variations on this phrase as well. Keep calm and carry on. You can see the, the crown there sort of as a reminder, like, you know, uh, trust us to take care of you. And yet, we might see that crown as a reminder that we can trust Jesus to take care of us. So keep calm. Keep calm. That means wait on the Lord. Carry on. That means endure. Keep going. Keep going to your journey's end. Keep calm and carry on. I want to share with you a story and uh, if you come back tonight, I'll have another object thing for you as well. This is from 2002. From 2002. Over in my office, I brought my medal. I forgot to bring it with me. This is when I ran my first marathon. Oh, wow. And when I say ran, I should probably put it in quotation marks because I walked a lot of it. But I ran more than I walked that first one. I was a young man back then. And Tanya and little baby John, and I'm not sure if my parents were, they were at that first one, or maybe the second one, the second one, I think, but, but Tanya and little baby John, and I ran along with my friend Dan and his wife, Rachel, and their son, Brian, was a baby too, they were all there at that time, but this is the sign that Tanya made for me in 2002, 20... Two plus years ago, right? <laughs> uh, and held it up as I ran by. Go, Jason, go. Uh, from Isaiah 40, 31, as a reminder to keep going. And the cool thing is that she was watching at Moody Bible Institute, which means around the two and a half mile mark down LaSalle Avenue, I ran by her. Go, Jason, go. And I saw Isaiah 40, 31. And I was like, all right, hope in the Lord, wait in the Lord, renew your strength, mount up with wings like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not be faint. And then some of you might know that the marathon goes up north and circles back and comes down Well Street. And I think you go by Moody again around mile 12, 12 and a half. And boy, that's a really great time to see that sign once again. Keep going. Go, Jason, go. And so I keep this sign. I took this picture this morning. I almost I injured myself when I was in my garage trying to take this picture. It's hanging on the wall. I had to move some junk that was blocking it. I keep that there to remind me not only the incursion of my wife through all these years to keep going in the race of ministry and the race of the Christian life, but ultimately that promise from Isaiah 40, 31, they shall mount up 
With wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. And I'll say before we pray in conclusion, if you want to see that medal, it's in my office. If you can't come back tonight, I'll show it to you. Uh, it's a reminder, not of something I accomplished, but of something that God, by his grace and empowerment, accomplished through me. And that's what life is. That's what a milestone birthday is. Maybe not a milestone birthday, but a birthday is to celebrate God's grace in our life and how he has kept us going and he gets all the glory. Amen? Amen. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for these verses. Sometimes, God, we do feel faint and weary. 